Understanding your child, managing problematic behaviors. I hope this presentation can give parents and professionals a better understanding of why children act the way they do and give you a few tips for moving forward for a better relationship with the children. Everyone has witnessed a meltdown in public. This reminds me of the screaming child in the aisle at Walmart or the parent who is screaming back at the child, dragging them out of the store. <laughs> Hopefully this has never been you yourself. Um, the screaming, kicking, whining, throwing themselves on the floor. Why do kids act this way? What's important to understand is that all behavior is a form of communication. Therefore, there's always a reason for the behavior. And in the moment, I know that's hard to remember and Adults don't always have the tools they need to respond appropriately, and that's where behaviors continue. As I mentioned, all behavior is a form of communication. The two main reasons for behaviors are either to seek or to avoid. The child may seek an item such as a certain toy or their favorite snack, they might want attention and not know how to get attention in a positive way. For example, a student in my class will purposely spill things or knock things over in hopes that someone will catch him doing it. Um, the child may also seek control of a situation. If we don't empower children positively or give them roles and responsibilities for things that make them feel important, they will often behave inappropriately to seek control. Also, there are some children who misbehave because of sensory pleasure or physical sensation. There's another student I worked with who anything he had in his hand, he felt the need to throw or destroy. So these are all ways that children may seek attention by acting inappropriately. The other reason we see behaviors, which is most common in schools, is to avoid. Children may act up before their least favorite academic group. That's the one I see most often. Or if they don't want to go to PE because they don't want to run, they might have a meltdown before they go. So in a school setting, I feel we notice more behaviors to avoid unpreferred activities. I think most of us are pretty confident in being able to identify problematic behaviors in younger children as the typical screaming, hitting, kicking, biting, stomping, and crying. But it's also important to think about behaviors in older children and adolescents. Older students may have a decrease in academic performance. They might show aggression, getting into fights. They might be talking back to their parents or teachers. They might show oppositional behaviors, which is doing the exact opposite of what they know they're supposed to do. There's also then withdrawal and depression and emotional concerns. The student may all of a sudden have a new group of friends that may not be a good group to be hanging with, um, or they might be experimenting with drugs or alcohol or making irrational decisions. And as a parent, I think it's important to keep an eye on your children, your child's typical behaviors and how they act and notice any change so you can hopefully get to the root of what's causing that because even these older children are still either seeking or avoiding something through these actions. It's also important to note that children can lack skills in things other than your typical academics such as reading, math, and writing. There are students who do not make adequate progress in their ability to be flexible and their tolerance for frustration. These are adaptive skills that need to be taught explicitly to some students, especially students with disabilities, and these skills are absolutely necessary in order for them to be able to deal appropriately with situations. When children lack flexibility, adaptability and frustration tolerance, 
they are lacking problem solving skills. That's when you see small things such as only finding mismatched socks or their sporting event gets canceled because of weather or they're not first in line on their way to lunch or they don't want to share their toy with another student. These small things that most children have learned to deal with appropriately become behavior explosions or your meltdown. So it's important for teachers and parents to work on teaching children these adaptive skills if they are not learning them on their own. Before I offer suggestions on ways to improve your relationship with your child or student, I'd like you to reflect on common ways that parents might think they are managing behaviors and then think about why these methods don't work. Yelling back at the child or raising your voice. Taking away preferred items or activities. Giving punishment. Making threats such as, I'm going to call your mom or I'm going to call your teacher. Better yet, how about making the other parent deal with it? This happens a lot in split families where the one parent who is dealing with the situation at the time may not know how to respond, so they get the other parent involved who has not even been a part of the situation. I, my brother dealt with this when he was younger with my parents. Um, my older brother lived with his mom in Phoenix and my dad lived here in Illinois and my dad always felt that he had to be the bad guy because his mother would call anytime he would get in trouble and want my dad to give punishment or a consequence over the phone even though he was not a part of it. And I think that that's um, a thing that parents need to understand is putting a strain on the relationship between that other parent and child. There needs to be communication and collaboration between the two parents, but there shouldn't always be one person giving the consequence. With an exception to the child sitting in timeout, these types of reactions do not help the child learn to better handle stressful situations. When an adult uses punishment or physical or verbal aggression with the child, what is that really teaching the child? Well, it's teaching them that anger solves problems. If children feel respected and their basic needs are being met, there will be no reason to communicate using problematic behaviors. It's one thing to identify the wrong ways to respond to behavior, but what are the right ways? You first have to understand what is causing the behavior. Behavior analysts and other professionals use what's called behavioral analysis in academic and clinical settings. This is known by some as the ABC model of behavior and is part of FBA, which is Functional Behavior Assessment. The idea is to focus on the reasons for the behaviors rather than the behavior itself. They identify the purpose and function of the behavior to then respond to the behavior and find a replacement. So here's what the ABCs of behavior are. A is for antecedent. This is what happens immediately before the behavior. You might call this the trigger. B is the behavior. Note that this can be a positive or a negative behavior. And C is the consequence. This is what happens immediately after the behavior. Although most think of the consequence as being negative, this can be positive too. For example, if a child raises their hand and answers a question, the consequence would be that the teacher would praise them. Or, in a home setting, the child may do their chores like they're supposed to, so the consequence is that the parent rewards them either by giving them something fun to do or taking them somewhere or even a verbal praise. 
So it doesn't always have to be negative. It's all about understanding what causes behaviors and what happens afterward. If you'd like more information about ABC analysis, there's a presentation by the Georgia State University. I've attached the link here and it provides a lot of great ideas for intervention and understanding behavior plans. So feel free to take a look. Most parents are not behavior analysts, we know that, but all parents can understand their child's preferences. Preferred objects change all the time, that's really important to understand. Make sure you stay current with what your child is interested in. It may be hard for children with disabilities to identify what they like and not like, so some of the ways that parents can understand children who may have trouble communicating is watching their eye gaze, do they light up? when you put a certain object in front of them. What is their body language like? Do they get excited? Do they reach toward the object or maybe they turn away? That would show a disinterest in the object. So we really have to get creative on figuring these things out for kid, kids who can't communicate that themselves. And remember to always reward positive behaviors. These do not have to be going to the store to buy a toy. They can be little things like giving a hug showing just sincere interest and praise. I really like that you were able to get all your chores done before I had to ask you. That makes me feel so proud of you. Something very specific and children respond well to that. It gives them intrinsic motivation to succeed and then hopefully you have less behaviors in the future. Um, token systems and behavior charts also work really well not only at school but also at home. If you're a parent, work together with your educators in school, figure out what's being used in the school, and hopefully you can work together to implement something at home that is similar, that the child is used to using, and can also be a nice way to work towards maybe some other rewards besides your praise or high five. So here are the, is the good stuff. Here's your tips and takeaways for parents. One, always follow through with rewards and consequences. Don't promise something or tell the child that you're going to give them a certain consequence and then don't do it because then they, they pick up on that very quickly and that's where you're going to get taken advantage of and they are going to try to press your buttons as much as they can. Number two, set limits and be consistent. Do not give in. Don't, um, don't haggle with them. Make sure that you are the one making the decisions, offering the choices, and that they are the ones responding. Don't have it come back at you where they are giving you the option. Number three, don't be afraid to ask for help. Talk to your teachers, other parents. There's blogs or support groups online. There's also tons of ideas on Pinterest parenting videos on YouTube, or even reference books. Four, take a break. This is really, really important for not only parents, but also educators to understand. It's okay for adults to take a break. Realize when you are bringing your own emotions into the situation, step aside, return when you can feel calm. Maybe this is five minutes, maybe this is the next day. We are not programmed to respond to behaviors if we are emotionally involved. When we are upset, that's when we say and do things that we don't mean or we are getting our own emotions involved to the extent that we've forgotten what the original behavior is about and we're not finding a way to manage that behavior for the future. And five, use I statements instead of you statements. Talk about the situation when everyone has de-escalated. This, for example, this would be like, I'm really sorry that you chose to make that choice. It makes me really sad. Put it on yourself and then say, but because of that, this is your consequence. So when you put it on you and say I instead of you, you, you did this, it makes the child empathize with you and less likely to make that same mistake in the future. These next few tips I learned from a parenting class called Love and Logic. 
we were grateful to have a Love and Logic representative come to our school and offer four parenting classes and I was fortunate to have attended and these are some of the things that I took away from the class. Number six, have an uh-oh spot. This is a quiet area the child goes if they're not acting appropriately. So at home, this would be similar to like a timeout area. But if you're in public, like a grocery store or a restaurant, this might have to be the corner of the room or even a bathroom. Plan ahead so that way you know how to respond appropriately if the child were to have a meltdown. You should practice these uh-oh spots or they encourage you to have a word. It might not be uh-oh for an older child, but some way to let them know you are not behaving how you should. Some like Q word. And make sure this is practiced at home before going out in public because if you don't have this set up, not only are you going to be more anxious when others are looking at you, but it's not going to be effective. So you modify this spot to make it age appropriate. Number seven, offer choice and share control within limits. They suggest offering two to three choices before the child starts to complain or get upset. The key word is before. Once they've began the behavior or are getting upset, it's too late. And also this way, you're maintaining the authority rather than bargaining with them. You're offering choices before anything happens. This is a way to be proactive instead of reactive. And this quote I thought was really neat. Um, empathy soaks up emotions. The more we can empathize with our child, the better our relationships are going to be with them, the more we are going to understand each other and be able to work together to have a positive relationship. This book, The Explosive Child, was written to help parents understand why children behave the way they do and how to respond to behaviors in an effective, non-punitive way. This book will teach parents how to identify situations where episodes might occur, so another way to be proactive, how to solve problems that cause negative behaviors, help, how to help your child develop problem-solving skills and flexibility. So again, that frustration tolerance and flexibility are skills that not every child picks up on automatically. They need to be taught explicitly in many cases. And how to reduce hostility and improve your relationships between parent and child. One, two, three magic has stories of parents who have overcome parenting challenges and it also offers strategies for parents to put in their parenting toolbox. Ms. Dr. Phelan, the author of the book, has broken up parenting into three easy steps. So if you're interested in what those three steps are, take a look at the book. This is a professional reference book for teachers. Um, it's basically a teacher survival guide for how to deal with challenging behaviors. It's been written primarily for pre-service, preschool, and primary teachers, but the new edition has information about inclusion and students with disabilities and how to understand children who come from other cultures and how to interact with their families better. It encourages educators to reflect on their own values and beliefs and also has current research on how stress can affect a child's brain, their executive functioning, and behaviors. Next, I'll share with you several stories that parents can use with their children for teaching them those adaptive skills and how to understand how to behave appropriately. A really neat series I found by Martin Agassi is called the Best Behavior Series. It guides children to choose positive behaviors using simple words in their colorful pictures to teach basic behaviors and concepts. What's neat about this series is that there are two versions. There's board books, which are for the infant and preschool age, and then there's the same titles in longer stories 
for ages four and up. So as you can see on this slide, there's the board book on the left, then there's the paperback, same title, and then there's also several titles that have a bilingual edition which shows the English and Spanish version of the text. This would be great to use with ESL students and families. Check out freespirit.com. This link I've provided offers not only this series, but they have other behavior book series that would be very effective for children to use. This specific book, Hands Are Not For Hitting, shows children how to manage their anger and teaches them that hitting is not acceptable. This story is meant to be read aloud, and there's also a parent section with extension activities and little conversation starters for how to bring up that discussion with your child. This book, Calm Down Time, is also by Free Spirit Publishing Company. Um, this shows children what to do when they're frustrated and feeling angry. So some of the tips they teach are to count to three, to take deep breaths, just those simple things that we can teach even the youngest of children. It also has tips for parents and caregivers. The, this is part of the toddler tools. So the other one was the behavior series. This is for toddlers. And there are other titles in this series that focus on daily routines and transitions. So some of the other titles are Bye Bye Time, Clean Up Time, Manners Time, Sharing Time, and Nap Time. And again, these, some of these titles are also available in the bilingual edition. Julia Cook is a popular children's author. She writes books that teaches children some of these social skills in a more comical way. My Mouth is a Volcano shows children how to not interrupt and how it feels when something happens back to you. So Lewis, the main character of the story, didn't realize how rude he was being to others until someone started interrupting him. The other title, I Just Don't Like the Sound of No, this character RJ has to learn how to accept the word no and how to disagree with someone in an appropriate way. So this shows children some of the social skills that they can use not only at school but also at home. This story, Angry Octopus, is one of four written by Lori Light. They are designed to decrease stress, anger, and anxiety for children. The other titles in the series are Affirmation Weaver, Sea Otter Cove, and Bubble Riding. What's neat is they, are also, they also have a CD-ROM that goes with them, and they show children how to use muscle relaxation and breathing techniques to calm themselves. This helps children control anger, reduce stress, and remain calm. This is a great book for older children because it's longer, so those that can handle a longer story, have a longer attention span, this would be nice to use. This is another story that teaches children how to manage their anger and deal with their emotions. It teaches them that all emotions are okay to have, it's just how you deal with them. So Cool Down and Work Through Anger is a story that is meant for children 4 to 8, but I used it with my 5th through 8th grade life skills students and it worked effectively as well. So at the end of the presentation you will see a reading that I used with my group. There are also extension activities and tips for parents. How to Take the Gur Out of Anger is a book for older students, eight and up. It shows children how to identify anger than themselves and how to better manage situations where they feel stressed out. And the newer version of the story also offers information on social media and how that is used inappropriately that is either bullying students or making children feel angry. This is also meant to be used with older kids. It's called What to Do When Your Temper Flares. This is a workbook guide. Um, it shows children and parents cognitive behavioral techniques for how to manage your anger. 
and it encourages children to get their thoughts out on paper and it teaches them four methods for handling their emotions. This is meant for children eight and up as well. On the left side of the page, you should see a square with my initials SS. If you click the bottom link, it will bring you to the revised YouTube video. The link on the top of the screen I actually had to delete because the video volume was not loud enough. So please click on the left to go to the correct video. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and can take away a few strategies for improving your relationship with your children and helping them manage their behaviors.